first, let them start by saying that, that they truly value the research and the detailed analysis. Um, and you've been spot on with your calls from a global macro perspective. Unfortunately, those phenomenal calls have not translated into the U.S. stock market declines we would all expect from you being so right. Um, sort of paraphrasing here, uh, it says, what will it take for you to be rewarded with your great research? And, and what do you feel? Uh, and and, and the, effectively, he's asking the longer this goes on um, in terms of fundamentals being disconnected from asset prices, the more frustrating it becomes and ultimately just diminishes the value of great research. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I mean, if you, val if you determine the value of research based on the last price of the market today, I'd agree with that. But I obviously completely disagree with that. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, what is the value of research? Uh, the value of research is ostensibly a being positioned for something big that is going to happen that has not yet happened. Is that, I'd say that that's fair. Uh, since I don't have an audience to say yes or no, or we don't make up an audience that laughs or cries, uh, I would say that that's a fair way to look at the value of research. So the value, of, we got paid huge on, I mean, our client, you, if you hadn't been a client, that's one thing, but it doesn't change the fact that if you weren't a season ticket holder, that we didn't hit that, those home runs, we didn't get in front of all those, you know, there's a massive drawdown, massive drawdown in, in, in U.S. equities from July to the February lows. And we didn't have to spend a whole bunch of time complaining and arguing about why it wasn't right or wrong. You know, the value of the research pays out asymmetrically, okay? At the same time, I think we've done a pretty good job on the long side of just keeping you with all the stuff that's continued to work. So I've had to learn this lesson throughout my career. You're not gonna get paid for what you consider great research every single day, or guess what? It wouldn't be considered great research. If you were getting paid on it every day, everybody would agree with the research. Great research is not what everybody agrees with every single day. It doesn't pay you every single day. But when you break out a 17 year career for me, and, you, and I look at it, I say to myself, Thank God I've never, and this is a fact, I have never been drawn down in a, in a down market. I've always been in front of it. I've always capitalized on the big ones. And that's a big deal for me. I mean, that's something that my research to me, I find very valuable. And I think that I've tried to communicate that to people, the value, that's why we call it hedge eye risk management. Not hedge eye, I wanna be a rock star, or hedge eye, I'm the man. Hedge eye, I call tops and bottoms every day of the week. No, that's not what I do. That's not what this team is built to do. What we're setting up to do is help you risk manage with a, a higher or lower level of probability on what is likely to happen next. So again, what is likely to happen next if we're right is that equity gains will be lost. Yeah, the equity gains will be most lost on the things that we don't like, which would include the financials. And hopefully, you know, we continue to get paid on these long bonds. Um, when we change that view, we'll change that view. But if, if you find value in the research and the process, please don't wake up every day frustrated that you're not getting paid. That's not how this game works. It's much more like any, any other profession, pick golf or something that I don't talk a lot about. I mean, imagine you went to the course every day and you say, you know what, damn it, my game must suck because I practice so much, I'm in such good shape, but I don't make a birdie on every hole. You know, if you had that attitude, you would be an awful golfer. You'd be actually a pretty miserable person. Uh, that's not how I wake up in the morning. I wake up totally, totally aware that I could be totally wrong each and every day of the week, uh, but also looking forward to the days where we make a lot of money when everybody else is crying and whining about what they missed. Yep. And I have some things to add as well. Uh, so on Thursday, I made the case, you know, so we had a similar question like this on Thursday, and I made the case that, you know, to the extent that research becomes useless or, or, not, or, val or not valuable in the marketplace, you also have the same headwinds to the active management industry. Um, so the ultimate winner there is obviously the in investors who can invest in passive products at a much lower fee structure. Um, but the ultimate losers there, if you sort of play that, run that ball forward, you know, is, is the economy and, and, and people. So you have, you, you know, passive investment is great for, you know, retail investors, but it's terrible for, you know, the allocation of capital. And, and you know, to what you effectively left with on the margins is lower productivity growth, lower GDP growth, um, you know, lower aggregate income growth than you otherwise would yeah, have had in, in an active, ma actively managed society. It's got where, a broader implication to the whole economy. Absolutely, so again. Financial services is a huge component of the U.S. economy. Yeah, totally. If you don't need us, then, you know, maybe we're not needed, but I, I would argue that, you know. Well, in <laughs> fact, if something never goes down, you don't need anything. You, you just need to know that it didn't go down yet. Well, um, could, yeah. so, so, like, that really is an important point. Yeah. I mean, 
it only it's only one way. The time that you need somebody to help you risk manage gold or treasuries on the short side, like we helped you do in 2013, or stocks finally breaking out for real, not up like passive aggressively. I mean, what the hell? I mean, the Nasdaq's up four or five percent this year, and everybody's pulling their hair out like, oh, I can't believe I'm getting killed. And it's, it's like, get a grip. Look at your career. Look at your net wealth. If you're not me, I mean, my career is a trivial matter. It's got a certain amount of years, and it's, you know, and it's going to clock until it clocks out. But look at your net wealth. Take a piece of paper. Let's say that you're like me, and you started with a negative number. Here's zero. So you're down here. You're this poor bastard who didn't come from money. Uh, you got to pay off your student loans. You got to work until you get a certain amount of money. You start to build some savings. All right, you come out of the box. You're out of zero. Let's say you got 10 bucks. Wow, you grew it to 100 bucks. Monthly, wow, now you got 10,000 bucks. I, I highly doubt that you buy the S&P 500 with the 10,000 bucks as soon as you get the 10,000. But take your life, let's say that you do this across 30, 40, 50, God willing, 80 years. What does this line look like? Not like that. Where did it go like this? Did you mitigate those drops? Did you or did you not? Because I can tell you one thing, there's a time where you just stay on the line and make no money, but you don't lose it. Stay, forget all this down stuff. I don't do that. I spend every day with this team trying to make sure that your line has as little volatility as possible to the downside and has options to the upside. I can show it. My net wealth is going to, and I'm not trying to you know, paint myself as some peacock. I mean, uh, on CNBC. I mean, my, my line is about as steady and up and to the right as any line you're going to find after I got to $10,000 with a lot of big jumps. Like in 03, I was up 81%. Why do you think I became a hedge, a hedge fund manager? 81%. You know, this is, there are moments of time where I will make a lot in something and there are a lot more times where I'm doing absolutely nothing because I like it when my line doesn't have all this stuff in it. It's just something that goes, actually, maybe you wouldn't need anything at all. It's just black with a line straight up into the right. <laughs> okay? So think about, think about your wealth that way. Don't think about a scheme that can get you rich quick. The, you don't go up into the right with, like a, with, a, with a tip or with a beautiful Tiffany blue box on owning something forever that has no downside. There is no asset that you probably own that hasn't done that unless you've been long Japanese government bonds for the last 30 years, okay? So, and treasuries for that matter, they might look close to it, but treasuries from a volatility adjusted return perspective look much more positive, at least in my lifetime, and certainly since we started Hedgeye, than, than stocks. I mean, and particularly if you are global macro and you define stocks as not just US stocks. I mean, we're talking about significant declines in significant countries, uh, and again, we didn't have you in those things. And again, I'm not trying to, you know, wax philosophically. I'm just trying to tell you that there's a difference. There's a huge difference in volatility adjusted returns and building your wealth without huge drawdowns.